Over half a million people in the United Kingdom suffer from a leg ulcer right now, and that number is expected to double in the next decade. That's over one million people. It's been called the silent crisis in venous care in the United Kingdom. How on earth are we going to treat all these patients? I'm here today to dismantle the myths that are stifling the widespread adoption of foam sclerotherapy. We're going to delve into some rather contentious areas of vein treatment, and the data may challenge some long-held beliefs. I'm going to directly refute the views of three eminent vein specialists, key opinion leaders, by examining the evidence. I will do so not to bring into question their honesty or integrity, but rather to start a critical analysis of the data. Now, let me say right from the start, the views I express today are mine, based on the available evidence, and they do not represent the views of any organisation I'm associated with. We've got five persistent myths that are holding back the true potential of foam sclerotherapy. And I have to tell you, it's high time we address them head on. First, that endothermal ablation reigns supreme. Second, that phlebectomy guarantees better outcomes. Third, that pigmentation is a serious, long-lasting problem. Fourth, that sclerotherapy poses a significant risk of DVT. And fifth, that it causes strokes. Frankly, it's time to test these ideas with hard data. So let's begin. Right, let's start with the first myth. Endothermal ablation superiority. How many of you have heard that endothermal ablation is the only gold standard? Now, there are many who believe that endothermal ablation is unequivocally superior to foam sclerotherapy, and they go to extraordinary lengths to demonstrate this. There is currently a trend for a technique called total endovenous laser. It appears to me that every abnormality in varicosity is cannulated and burnt in the expectation that it gives the best results. But does it? I believe this is a fallacy perpetuated by outdated guidelines and selective interpretations of the data. Now, we've all heard the gold standard rhetoric, but let's be honest, the class trial, it's flawed for so many reasons that I felt compelled to cover them in a recent video podcast. And I'll put links to that podcast in the description. I don't have time right now to take it apart in this presentation, but what I will say is that the class trial is no longer relevant to modern methods of foam sclerotherapy as practiced by experts. Now, if we look at the data, Hugh Davis's review shows comparable success rates between foam sclerotherapy and endothermal ablation, particularly when we are looking at patient reported outcomes. And that's what really matters. Farah et al. in this study confirms this. And let's not forget that ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is significantly cheaper, probably by as much as 30%. So let's lay that one to rest. Endothermal ablation isn't the be all and end all. Moving on, myth number two, phlebectomy gives guaranteed results. Let's expose the limits of surgical intervention here because the claim that meticulous phlebectomy guarantees superior results while dismissing foam's effectiveness is simply not supported by the evidence. Now, I spoke to Professor Campbell a while ago. Now, Professor Campbell, with all due respect, those jolly tender lumps aren't a reason to dismiss foam. And this is important because Professor Campbell is the president of the Venus Forum and people listen to him. In God we trust, all others must bring data. Let's remind ourselves of what Professor Campbell said in my podcast. Now, one of the interesting things is, Bruce, and I, I am surprised about this, I used to think that phlebectomy gave the best cosmetic results and the best outcomes. And what I'm finding is that when I speak to experts who do a lot of foam sclerotherapy, they disagree and they get 
very good results from foam sclerotherapy. And so perhaps the argument should be, maybe, we who used to think that phlebectomy is so good ought to find out why it is that people who do sclerotherapy get as good, if not better results, with well, less I mean, nerve damage, I would. And if we're yeah. talking about nerve damage, Bruce, which we yes, seem to yes, be, yes. Oh, I agree. You, don't, you, don't get, you don't get nerve damage, you don't get bleeding, yeah. you don't get infection, and you don't get those annoying little telangiectasias around the phlebectomy sites that can sometimes mar an otherwise good cosmetic outcome. I've, I've been teased extensively uh, having discussions with colleagues, like I am with you now, Bruce, who are advocates, strong advocates for foam sclerotherapy. And one of the eye openers for me over the last year has been joining a group on LinkedIn called Foam Sclerotherapy Experts, where I've learned so much from international colleagues, from those in North America and those in Europe and uh, Latin America, who perform more sclerotherapy than we do here. Well, I mean, I think two or three things to say. One is, I mean, I have no, I have no sort of ax to grind about any of these uh, procedures. Done well, any of these can work well. When you talk about foam sclerotherapy, I think there are, I suppose, two issues. The first is, if you're doing foam sclerotherapy for extensive veins, including truncal veins, it does bother me, it just bothers me about what is happening near the very top of the vein, up near the groin, deep in the popliteal fossa, just trying to visualise what's happening there in terms of where the foam goes, where it stays, how much ablation you get. And I think the failure to deal with those areas may be one of the reasons that the truncal ablation rates for foam are lower than those for endothermal tech. And then there is the more modern business, which I haven't yet quite got my head around, of people who are doing, for example, endothermal ablation and then dealing with the varicosities with foam. And precisely how you do that and the sequence of it, I haven't quite got my head around yet, which clearly, clearly you have. The other consideration for me with foam is that I've done a lot of foam sclerotherapy and I still do a fair amount of it. To me, patients vary a lot. You know, however careful you are, however much you inject some saline first and elevate the limb and bandage and all this, that and the other, some patients do get jolly uncomfortable lumps. They get uncomfortable lumpiness. It can take a long time to settle down. And in particular, for patients with very pale skin, I'm very, very careful about warning them about brown pigmentation, which usually fades, but occasionally it doesn't. Whereas, with careful phlebectomies, well, I ask all my patients, but with careful phlebectomies combined with glue, or it could be laser or whatever, one in three of my patients takes no analgesia at all. Most of them take some paracetamol for 24, 48 hours. But in general, they're just not sore. They may have a slightly bruised leg, and particularly if they've got very big veins. But if you're ligating veins, as I do, and then bandaging firmly, and there's no blood on the operating table, they have, a, they have a guaranteed result. I can look them in the eye and say, tomorrow, all your veins will be gone. And they're gone, and they've got some little incisions to heal up, and I guess they've got some scars. But to me, it's more dependable than I feel with foam. I'm not saying either's right or wrong, but I just feel more confident in it. I think it's more reliable, it's more predictable. And that's why I like it. The downside is it takes a heck of a lot of time and it's really fiddly. You can do foam much quicker than you can doing careful phlebectomies. But I'm still I'm still in the phlebectomy school. I still do prefer it. Now, now we've heard what Professor Campbell has to say. Here's the data. A review by Professor Alan Davis and his team shows higher patient satisfaction with foam especially for larger varicosities. Now we need to look at the evidence, not just rely on surgical tradition and the assertion of eminent key opinion leaders, sometimes referred to as eminence-based medicine. Myth number three, pigmentation. The fear-mongering surrounding pigmentation as a significant complication of foam sclerotherapy is grossly exaggerated. Yes, if we look carefully at everybody, there is some degree of pigmentation after every treatment of foam sclerotherapy.
but it's transient. Dr. Chris Pittman, a foam sclerotherapy expert in Florida, points out that persistent pigmentation after foam sclerotherapy indicates persistent reflux and the need for more foam sclerotherapy. Most studies show that pigmentation resolves completely in 6 to 12 months, so let's not let a minor transient cosmetic issue overshadow a highly effective treatment. The assertion that foam sclerotherapy poses a substantial risk of DVT is another misrepresentation of the data. The data is clear. Parsi's study shows a DVT rate of 0.07%. That's tiny. Now, to put it in perspective, that's much less than the risk of DVT after endovenous laser, 0.28%. We can't let fear-mongering dictate our clinical practice. Finally, myth number five, the risk of stroke. The idea that foam sclerotherapy poses a substantial risk of stroke is a misrepresentation of the data yet again. Hugh Davis's study shows a stroke rate of 0.04%. Again, an extremely low rate we must look at the data. Many vein experts, myself included, regard foam sclerotherapy as the Swiss army knife of vein care. But this notion that foam sclerotherapy can be used to treat any vein in the legs has been ridiculed by some very prominent vein specialists. Let's hear what Professor Mark Whiteley had to say when I spoke to him in a recent podcast. And one of the ridiculous things you'll have seen in the uh, uh, correspondence <laughs> I've been having with other people who uh, started answering your question, is foam enough? It clearly isn't enough to be only foam sclerotherapy. That just is a ridiculous thing for every patient. It can't possibly be with such a huge range of venous diseases. So where we got into the conversation, going, he was sort of saying, well, you know, where's the way the protocol? Well, the way the protocol is if every single patient has an individual pattern of disease with different veins of different sizes, different velocities, different wall thicknesses, different sclerosis and everything, a protocol can only be based upon the way a patient goes through it and then using the research we've got pulling together the right tools into those stages to get the patient the right outcome. And to sort of think there's some magic potion that you can just say, oh, do ABC, it's just ridiculous. What you have to do is you have to understand it's all about giving accurate diagnosis, followed by once you've got accurate diagnosis, you have a roadmap. And then once you have a roadmap, you then go hemodynamics, biology, cosmesis. And that's the three stages. Here's the other thing, Mark, from a purely practical and utilitarian approach. There aren't enough vascular technicians. There aren't enough people trained in the Whiteley protocol. There aren't enough catheters and ablation kits in the world to treat everybody who's currently suffering with a leg ulcer. Isn't it fair to say then that ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is the only practical solution we have to this public health problem? Uh, well, you're, you're asking the wrong person, aren't you? You can talk, talk to a politician or a public health doctor. I'm here, as I've said right from the beginning, the Whiteley Protocol is based to get the person who is in front of me the very best treatment. And the person in front of anybody who I've trained to get the very best treatment. If you want to start talking about politics and about co uh, economics and everything else and provision and education, there's, there's someone else's problem. My, my problem is to train doctors who are interested in getting the best results to get the best results and to make sure they're trained in a way that the patient in front of us is getting the best results. So that's what Professor Whiteley has to say, but the evidence is clear. Foam sclerotherapy can treat virtually any abnormality in the superficial venous system from telangiectasias to reticular veins, to varicose veins, incompetent perforated veins, truncal reflux and recurrent veins. No other treatment modality has been shown to be unequivocally superior. Foam sclerotherapy is not just another option. It's the only universally applicable and scalable solution to the burgeoning vein care crisis. We've got a growing number of vein care patients needing treatment, especially with leg ulcers. Endothermal devices can't keep up. And it won't be long before there will be one million people in the United Kingdom with leg ulcers. There's a report suggesting a doubling 
of people with leg ulcers every decade. And we just need to have a realistic treatment option for this public health crisis. There simply aren't enough radio frequency catheters or laser fibers in the world to address even the public health problem of leg ulcers, let alone the other stages of venous disease. We must have a proper debate about spherotherapy. We need to push for evidence-based practice. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and that way you won't miss my next video.